course, our Vice President for External Relations. Um, I'm so glad to see all of you here today for this important book talk um, with these two just terrific military analysts, scholars, authors, um, and I want to tell you a little bit about both of them. Uh, Mark Moyer, Dr. Moyer, is a historian and analyst of contemporary national security affairs. He's the Kim T. Adamson Chair of Insurgency and Terrorism and Professor of National Security Affairs at the Marine Corps University of Quantico. Um, his previous books include Triumph Forsaken, the Vietnam War, 1954 to 1965, and Phoenix and the Birds of Prey, Counterinsurgency and Counterterrorism in Vietnam. Mark's articles have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and other publications. You may have seen his op-eds in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal in the last couple months about Afghanistan. Um, Mark is a Harvard grad and a, and a Cambridge, and he received his uh, PhD from Cambridge. Um, his new book, A Question of Command, which we're going to be discussing today, um, Counterinsurgency from the Civil War to Iraq, is really a must read. And, and judging from the response here, I can see, you know, that you guys are all very interested and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to it in, in just a bit. Uh, Tom Ricks, um, who's near and dear to our hearts here at CSIS. Tom, um, as you may know, is uh, one of the, the, the great military journalists of all time. Um, he's been with the Washington Post. He's been before that. He was with the Wall Street Journal for 17 years, and he's been part of two Pulitzer Prize-winning teams, one with the Journal, one with the Washington Post. Um, you know, of course, Tom wrote his seminal book, the seminal book on Iraq, Fiasco, um, here at CSIS when he was a writer in residence, and we've always been very grateful um, for his guidance uh, and his policy expertise. Um, Tom is now at the Center for a New American Security, a fantastic think tank, national security think tank, uh, based here in Washington, and he's also a contributing editor to Foreign Policy Magazine, where he writes one of the, the just the best blogs anywhere. It's called The Best Defense, and I strongly urge that you go to foreignpolicy.com if you haven't to, uh, to take a look at it. Uh, of course, um, Tom grew up in New York and Afghanistan and is a graduate of Yale. Um, question of Command, Counterinsurgency from the Civil War to Iraq. Uh, Mark's latest book, A Question of Command, um, presents a wide-ranging history of counterinsurgency from the Civil War and Reconstruction to Afghanistan and Iraq, making it really one of the most timely books out there today. Um, through a series of case studies, Mark identifies the, the ten critical attributes of counterinsurgency leadership and reveals why these attributes have been much more prevalent in some organizations than others. Um, Mark also explains how the U.S. military and America's allies in Afghanistan and Iraq should revamp their personnel systems in order to elevate more individuals with those kind of attributes. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Moyer, who will deliver some comments. Mark. Thank you, Andrew, very much for that uh, kind introduction, and thanks to CSIS for hosting this event. Thanks to Tom Ricks for uh, offering to discuss this talk today. Uh, as was mentioned, this is really perfect timing for a book on this subject. And it's not just because the interest in balloon boys started to wane, but, uh, but in fact, we do stand at a crossroads in, in Afghanistan. And we face problems there which I think are, at, at their core, questions of leadership. And I think also the solutions to those problems uh, will probably have a lot to do with, with leadership. And, and so I'm going to first talk a little bit about how I came about writing this book. Uh, then I'm going to go into detail on some of the points in the book that I think are particularly relevant uh, as we think about how we move forward in Afghanistan. I arrived at the U.S. Marine Corps University in the middle of 2004, and um, like most recent PhDs, my interests were somewhat narrow. I, I had been working on Vietnam War for quite some time. Uh, but coming in there, we had, uh, began an overhaul of the curriculum that involved putting much more emphasis onto counterinsurgency because we had a lot of uh, new, new Marines coming in from, Afghan or, excuse me, from Iraq. The new director who came in had actually served in the, in the first battle of Fallujah, the one where Americans, Marines went in and, and were stopped halfway. And I was put in charge of a course that focused on counterinsurgency and looked particularly at foreign cultures and at uh, interagency operations. And in order to do that, I had to go sort of outside my 
comfort zone and look at a lot of other insurgencies that I wasn't all that familiar with and ended up for the course picking a lot of the cases that actually appear in the book. So we, we tested some of them, uh, found some were better than others, and I've included the ones that I think are most helpful. And then in the course of teaching this, I got to talk to lots of Marines. We also have a lot of uh, Army, Air Force, Navy, civilian, international students. And uh, it, it was really an eye-opening experience. In the course of putting together this course and teaching it, uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, we were not teaching them, in many cases, everything that we ought to be doing. And I, and I had reached a similar conclusion about Vietnam from working on that. But um, if you look at the literature on the Vietnam War and many of these other wars, a lot of it's uh, more written for academics than for practitioners of counterinsurgency. There's I think inordinate emphasis on strategy and abstract theories, and I think a lot of times far too much effort is spent on doing things like defining terms. So I wanted to do something that was really of great use to the practitioner. And the thing that ultimately pushed me into to stopping work on Vietnam to do this book was the outbreak in violence in Iraq after the Samara bombings in 2006. And you probably remember seeing the images of dead corpses in Baghdad streets, dozens of them every night, um, American casualties going, going way up. So that was what finally inspired me to, uh, to get cracking on a question of command. Uh, the book is largely historical. As I mentioned, I'm a historian. And so there are nine historical cases, the last two being Iraq and Afghanistan uh, up to 2008. And it does draw at the end some general lessons from those various cases, although I, I point out repeatedly that in counterinsurgency there are very few instruments that will work in all cases. So an important part of the leadership is being able to figure out when you can use those particular methods. The, the first case I'm going to talk about is the Malayan emergency of 1948 to 1960. And I'm going to start in the middle of that insurgency in October 6th of, of 1951. So on that date, the British High Commissioner, Sir Henry Gurney, decided to take a trip to Fraser's Hill, which is about 65 miles outside the capital city of, of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he went in a four-vehicle convoy, but on the way, two of the vo vehicles had to stop for technical reasons. But they pressed on, and when they came to a turn in the road where they had to almost come to a stop. Their vehicles were ambushed by 38 guerrillas. And uh, Gurney's wife stayed in the car. He, he decided to try to make a run for it and uh, was shot down, shot dead. And this was a catastrophic loss for the counterinsurgents. At that time, Malaya was still a British colony. And so this was the supreme authority in the country being killed in an ambush by the enemy. The war was already going against them. So it seemed like things just really could not get any worse in Malaya. Something very important happened just a few weeks later, and that was that Winston Churchill returned uh, to the position of prime minister after elections in Britain. And Churchill, being a man with a keen eye for talent, selected Sir Gerald Templer to go out and take command of the counterinsurgency. And everyone knows that Templer came in with a, within a matter of months, had turned the counterinsurgency around. And by the time he left, 28 months later, the counterinsurgents were on the, the road to victory. Now, the question of how he did it is much less uh, well understood. And there's a, a common argument that, that what he really did was that he codified some best practices, put them into a counterinsurgency manual, and the, the distribution of this manual helped them figure out how to defeat the enemy. And in fact, you'll see that interpretation in the Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Manual, FM 324. And part of the reason that manual was written because of this belief that Templar's manual had been the be all end all in Malaya. But I, I did some digging into this in the process of working on the book, and I found that that interpretation just was not quite correct. Because if you look, at their strategy, they used something called the Briggs Plan. The Briggs Plan had actually been in effect since 1950. And the tactics they used, in fact, were not any different. They had 
in previous years developed some tactics based heavily on what had been learned in Palestine and Burma and southern Africa. So how was it then that he was able to use strategy and tactics that had failed in the past in order to achieve success in the future? Well, the answer is that he was able to make dramatic improvements in leadership quality down to the local level. And he did at first start at the top. He fired his top subordinate, Vincent Del Tufo, who was described as the Secretary of State for Colonies as a man who has no power of command and gives out no inspiration and is, of course, quite useless as Chief Secretary. Uh, but T Templer toured the countryside. He spent a lot of his time in what we now call battlefield circulation. He went out and questioned officers to see who knew what was going on, and he was not hesitant to fire people on the spot. Uh, and there was quite a lot of room for opportunity here. Uh, among the people he fired were an officer who he described as an awfully nice fellow but quite gaga, uh, and another whom he called absolutely burnt out and useless, although a nice chap. So Templer was, uh, was a fairly ruthless individual, but I think that's what the situation demanded. He brought in a new team of uh, upper management, and in this he was greatly assisted by Winston Churchill, who promised to let him have the best and the brightest from the British Empire. So he went and looked all across Britain's far-flung possessions for top leaders. And for example, they uh, picked a new commissioner of police, uh, who, who happened to be the, the police chief in London, who was a fantastic individual. And at lower ranks, he imported British and Australian officers from various places to lead not only British troops, but also um, indigenous forces. And, and this is, I think, a marked contrast to what we've seen lately in our own personnel systems. So we've heard General McChrystal talk about how he can't get anything out of the Pentagon to, and to get people out of there, it's, it takes months. And we're still, I think, operating on a, a peacetime personnel system to a large extent. Um, now, Templer also, by spending so much of his time out in the field, served uh, as an inspirational force. And many of the officers who were there testified to just the, the uh, electrifying effect that he had by going out and talking to people. And he also spoke a lot to the population and then uh, in, in most cases also had a positive effect on him, although there, were, there was the occasional slip up. Um, at one village where the, the guerrillas had ambushed government forces, um, Templer showed up and, and declared, um, you're a bunch of bastards. And the, the interpreter translated this as, his excellency informs you that he knows that none of your mothers and fathers were married when you were born. Um, and then Templer continued, you may be bastards, but you'll find out that I can be a bigger one, which was translated as, his Ex excellency does admit, however, that his father was also not married to his mother. <laughs> um, as a result of Templer's personnel changes and his contagious spirit, the government started collecting a lot more intelligence on the insurgents. They were uh, patrolling more aggressively, and uh, they denied, started denying the insurgents access to the population, forced them to live in the jungle, where you maybe think they, they're okay in the jungle, but in fact, there was almost nothing edible in the jungle, so food supply became a big problem for them and led to their attrition. So as I said, by the time he leaves there, the insurgents are headed towards uh, defeat. So, Question of Command uses this case uh, and the eight other cases to, uh, first of all, uh, put forward an alternative view of how you, how you win uh, counterinsurgency, one that is really uh, significantly different from the main schools of thought right now. One of, the, one of those um, schools of thought is known as the population-centric, uh, also known as the hearts and minds. There's also the enemy-centric view. I'll talk about those in a minute. But I argue that the, the key in counterinsurgency is, is leadership, and especially at the local level. Uh, you, and these leaders have to be adaptive, and that means you cannot, you don't rely heavily on doctrine or on theories to figure out what has to be done. Um, and we've seen in counterinsurgency, uh, and again in Iraq and Afghanistan, that we've had the most success when the authority was pushed down to the lowest levels. Uh, because of the complexity of the situation. And this also means, by the way, that you don't have to have necessarily a, a strong central government, as a lot of people seem to think we need to have in, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, if you look at the successes in Iraq in 2006, 2007, uh, in terms of win in particular in terms of 
gaining the uh, participation of local elites, the American commanders there and the Iraqi commanders had oftentimes had almost no connection to the central government. Now, we'll say a good central government does help, and I'll talk more about that as well, because central authorities do often select the commanders or do things that can help or hinder them. Now, the, the population-centric view argues that what you really need to succeed in counterinsurgency is you need to create governmental legitimacy, and you do this by uh, social and economic and political reforms that will bring an end to the population's grievances. And they also believe that you should minimize the use of force because force tends to alienate the, the population. And I do agree that that gaining people's support is important, but I, uh, I tend to take a different view of how you do that. I think security is a big part of it, and also good governance and virtuous governance, but not these big social and economic programs. If you look in Afghanistan, uh, foreign governments and charities and the UN have poured tons of money into these uh, big social programs, economic development programs, and it's had very little effect on the insurgency. And people have been more concerned with uh, number one, security, whether whether their lives going to be at stake. They've also been more concerned about how they've been treated, especially by the Afghan National Police, which has, has been engaged in a lot of criminal activity. As one uh, Afghan researcher put it, uh, people don't care if the roads are paved with gold. They would rather have security. Now, after the population-centric school, which uh, incidentally is, is a big part of the counterinsurgency manual, uh, the next most popular is the, the enemy-centric school, which holds that the key is really uh, using force to uh, destroy the insurgents, use, uh, and that once you do that, things will be fine. And I do agree with some of the main points of, of the enemy-centric view. I think it is critical that you uh, kill or capture a large number of the insurgents, because we see time and again, you, in most cases, you're going to have to do that. And I think it's also the case that popular opinion and popular attitudes shift according to security. It's actually beneficial to you if you can direct force at the enemy and not at the civilian population. And if you look at again, major sites of success in Iraq, like al Qaim and Ramadi, uh, Tal Afar, you see that there was very extensive force used at the beginning of those engagements and to some extent throughout those, those engagements. So I don't think the idea of fighting without winning, I don't think, applies in most cases. And this is also, I think, very relevant to Afghanistan because we hear a lot of talk now about how we should opt for reconciliation, but I don't think you can have the reconciliation in most cases without having the security first, and I think that is part of uh, what General McChrystal's thinking on this issue is as well. So how did I arrive at this leader-centric view? Well, I, I covered a lot of that in the book. I won't belabor it now because um, it's – less important than some of the other things I would like to talk about. But if you look at particular conflicts, for example, Malaya, you'll see that as the quality of the leadership goes up and down, the effectiveness in counterinsurgency tends to go up and down, and it, it has greater impact than anything else on the state of affairs of the war. Not to say that other things aren't significant, you know, resources, for example, can be very important, but, but it's a critical variable. And if you also look at individual cases, where you had one commander replaced by someone else and you have very different results, usually that's a function of individual uh, leadership. The bulk of the book is really devoted to how do we improve leadership in counterinsurgency, because that's really what, what we want, especially for practitioners, for policymakers. And this is actually something that really has not been done in any sort of systematic way. Now, one of the first things I do is look at what are the challenges to getting rid of underperforming leaders? Because you know, sometimes you might think, well, it's easy. All you do is you just fire these people and uh, no brainer. But you've got a lot of things that prevent that from happening. First of all, you have uh, the sympathy factor. Uh, oftentimes the commanding officers will, ha will develop a, a, per a close relationship with their subordinates and they've also probably invested a lot of time in helping develop that person so they may be reluctant for that reason. In a lot of countries, the commanders have friends or relatives in high positions in the government, and those people are going to uh, protect them. And oftentimes, there's a fear that if you fire too many people, you're going to inhibit uh, 
initiative and you may undermine morale. So it, it takes, I think, very tough as well as smart commanders to break through these obstacles. And Templar is a fine example of that. Another, I think, was Ramon Magsaysay in the Philippines. And Magsaysay, like Templar, spent a lot of his time in the field. He would go around. In fact, he would oftentimes wear an Aloha shirt and so no one would, would uh, know who he was, at least from a distance. And he would show up unannounced to see what was going on. If he found the troops were sitting around doing nothing or they were out there stealing chickens, uh, that commanding officer was uh, going to get demoted or fired almost certainly. And Max Saisei also was willing to fire his friends and relatives, which is something that is oftentimes not the case. And Karzai is, I think, a good example of someone who is not particularly interested in doing that. Um, and at one point, Max Saisei's generals came to him and said, sir, all these changes are starting to demoralize the, the army. And Max Saisei's reply was, I don't care if, if they're bad, then I'm going to demoralize them some more. Now, in, in most of the book's cases, there's also quite a few instances where political considerations outweigh merit in how commanders are chosen. And sometimes, especially in the military, uh, there's a tendency to say, well, that's terrible. How, you know, how dare we let that happen? And certainly, it can be damaging in, in many ways. But you also do have to keep in mind that war is you know, ultimately a political activity. And so there are cases where politics maybe should trump merit. And our own civil war is an excellent example of that. Uh, Abraham Lincoln gave generalships to a lot of inexperienced politicians in the North in order to get their help in recruiting people from their state, getting votes, and so forth. Um, you, I think they, you know, ultimately at the higher level, you have to come up with some sort of balance between merit and between these political considerations. Now, in Afghanistan, I think there hasn't been that balance in, in many cases, and the Karzai government has not put merit ahead often enough. In the book, I also go into a lot of detail on what foreign powers e.g. the United States and Afghanistan, uh, can do in order to help improve the leaders of their indigenous allies. And, and we know in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, the indigenous allies have had severe leadership problems. You know, surprisingly, this has often been ignored by, by senior officials, in particular in the United States. Um, you know, in, the, in Vietnam, after we entered the ground war in 1965, General Westmoreland basically ignored the leadership of the South Vietnamese forces for several years and let them try to sort it out, which you know, seemed to be a nice gesture of deference towards South Vietnamese sovereignty, but, but the reality was it, it allowed problems to fester. And in Iraq, we know in the early years, uh, CPA did not pay very close attention to who the Iraqis were choosing as police commanders or National Guard commanders with uh, very unfortunate results. Now, smarter great power allies have come up with a variety of, uh, at times, ingenious ways to, to deal with this problem. And um, some of them are worth, I think, considering in Afghanistan, although, again, I would emphasize that, uh, you know, ultimately the senior decision makers have the, or should have the greatest knowledge and uh, need to look at all the different options that have worked in the past and try to come up with ideas about what might work here. And the, the highest risk and highest reward was uh, the use of covert action to actually replace the chief of state. Um, and this has worked sometimes. It, in Vietnam, it was actually a catastrophic failure. In, in 1963, we um, orchestrated the overthrow of South Vietnam's president, Ngo Dinh Diem. And turns out he was actually better than a lot of people thought. And the people after him were a lot worse. And, and the war really went downhill drastically. After that, and we saw also lots of people being purged from the government because they were seen as be having been loyal to Ziem. Uh, a milder form of action that's been used was used in uh, El Salvador, where we funneled money into the uh, political campaign of one of the presidential candidates, uh, Jose Napoleon Duarte. And that money allowed him to overtake his main rival in the poll and ultimately proved to be a blessing for the counterinsurgency. And we got a more recent example, which uh, has been disclosed, and people like Tom Ricks have talked about it, but uh, I think a lot of people don't remember this. But in 2006, the United States, through uh, in 
pressure and various means orchestrated the removal of Iraq's first democratically chosen prime minister, Ibrahim Il-Jafari. I should hasten to add that he, I think, fully deserved to be kicked out. He was known for filling his government with these Shiite militia leaders, the ones who created these secret prisons and were out there killing all sorts of people for sectarian reasons. Uh, and we also know that during one uh, critical meeting where lots of things had to be uh, decided, he decided to spend three hours talking about whether to tomato paste should be introduced as part of the rations for Ramadan. Uh, but that was actually, I think, a, a, a good use of our diplomatic leverage. Another thing that's often works well is promising additional aid. And this tends to work better than the threat of withdrawing aid because it's seen it, uh, as, as a lesser infringement on sovereignty, but it has worked very well. In the Huck Rebellion, we used the promise of extra aid to get them to change their Secretary of National Defense. And the person we got installed was Ramon Magsaysay, who turned the war around almost single-handedly and uh, a huge success. Uh, we may need to think about you know, other uses of aid in this way in Afghanistan. For example, uh, if we want to try to get some sort of power sharing between Karzai and Abdullah, Abdullah, I think also to influence who becomes part of the cabinet. The, again, the secretary of, uh, in this case, the defense minister uh, or the interior, interior minister can be crucial. We've got two good people in those positions in Afghanistan right now. And Karzai did promise to give away some of the cabinet positions during the election to buy people's favor. So that's going to be a, a huge issue going forward. Uh, there ha have also been instances where foreign governments have tried to influence the whole way that leaders are selected. And in Afghanistan, it was recognized pretty early on that Karzai was giving out too many jobs to his friends, to his uh, relatives, to members of his tribe. And so the World Bank and NATO got together and said, we're going to force you to adopt a merit-based hiring system. And so Karzai said, okay, fine, we'll do that. But they had to have the Afghans involved at some level. And it turns out that Karzai and, and some of the other senior leaders ended up uh, skirting the system. You know, for example, the, there would be tests for officers, and they would take the test answers and sneak them to their friends. So without a high-level buy-in, it really was not all that effective. Uh, a more effective way uh, that requires more uh, pressure on the host government is to actually control who their uh, commanders are. And we did this in Vietnam with the Provincial Reconnaissance Unit Program. And by the CIA selecting the leaders of these uh, elite paramilitary forces, we were able to remove the influence of politics. And these forces were outstanding. They were the most effective in collecting information from the people, extremely effective at, uh, at ambushing. The, you know, the model we've used most often is also the one that with the, the least risk, which is simply trying to use persuasion uh, of our allies. And I've found, particularly in the cases studied in the book, that this depends heavily on the quality of personal relationships. And so the ambassador, the senior military, um, leader in the country tend to be very important in, in, in uh, particularly you know, what sort of so social skills do they have, do they have the right kind of personality, that they can engage that foreign leader. Um, and it suggests, I think, too, that, that we be wary of uh, efforts to try to bring in people from out of the country for important diplomatic missions like special envoys and, and centers and so forth, although apparently that has worked lately at least one case. But if you look at Vietnam, for example, you had very highly personable individuals like Edward Lansdale or William Colby who, who got very close to the South Vietnamese president and were able to convince him to do a lot of things the United States wanted him to do. You know, on the other end, you had some who were standoffish, who didn't have social skills, some of whom were actually uh, rude to the South Vietnamese president. And in those cases, sometimes the South Vietnamese president would actually do the opposite of what we wanted just because he was so offended. Um, Ambassador Elbridge Durbro was probably the worst of these. Uh, in fact, he was so bad, the, the chief of the American military mission said that Durbro was better suited to be the senior salesman in a good lady's shoe store than to be representing the U.S. in an Asian country. Now, when you don't have 
a cadre of experienced leaders to draw on, and you want to build forces quickly, which is what we face now in Afghanistan, you do want to spend a lot of time on developing leaders. And main, important thing to stress here is that it is time consuming because uh, a lot of people assume you can just sort of create all these new forces out of nowhere. Uh, and you can, what you can do is you can train and equip these forces, you can give them weapons and uniforms, but you can't create the leaders you need in that short time frame. Typically you need at least 10 years, a lot of people would say 15 to 20 years to build people like battalion commanders, district police chiefs, and those are the senior commanders at the local level and are really crucial in counterinsurgency. If you don't have that experienced leadership, what happens is your experienced leaders get spread way out. You end up having to give authority to officers who just don't have the experience or may not have the talent either. And we saw this, for example, in El Salvador. Uh, insurgency started there in 1980, and somebody said, well, hey, there's more insurgents. Let's double the security forces. It sounds like a great idea, uh, which is similar to what we heard today. But the problem is that uh, they didn't have the leaders and they didn't have a lot of Americans there to help out either. And so you created these forces, but a lot of them ended up getting involved in death squads that were going around, uh, gunning people down, civilians, many who weren't necessarily closely tied to the insurgency. And this not only fueled opposition in El Salvador, but also created opposition in the U.S. Congress, which made it more difficult to get aid for the war. This time factor has also been ignored when people have tried to introduce a whole new elite class and supplant the old elites in trying to run a country. In Iraq, uh, we removed the Ba'athists and the leadership of the Iraqi military and brought in exiles and other people who didn't have a whole lot of experience running country, and this was very uh, ably chronicled by Tom Ricks in, in Fiasco. We saw how disastrous that was. Uh, another good example actually is Reconstruction after the Civil War, and uh, which I found to be a fascinating case. And we, we have, by the way, introduced that in our curriculum. And, and a lot of people never thought about it as counterinsurgency, but the, the parallels to a lot of other experiences, including Iraq, are pr pretty striking. Um, the radical Republicans in Congress decided that they had enough of the southern white elites and so they uh, banned them from voting and they brought in the so-called carpetbaggers and scalawags and freemen to run the government uh, without really thinking about whether these people really had the qualifications to, to run the government. And you ended up seeing a lot of the same things we've seen in uh, Afghanistan recently as well as Iraq. Corruption on a massive scale, uh, ineptitude, voter fraud, uh, the use of mood-altering substances, although back then it was alcohol rather than the marijuana you see in Afghanistan. Um, and these ineffective reconstruction elites also allowed crime to flourish. And the former Confederate officers were particularly upset by this, as was the population. And so they formed the, their uh, white militia organizations, including the Ku Klux Klan, Klan and many others, um, initially as vigilante organizations that were going to restore law and order. In fact, it's, I think it's very similar to what happened uh, in Afghanistan in certain ways in that uh, the Taliban has been able to make a lot of inroads because they've been pretty good at uh, maintaining order and providing trials when the government's not been able to do that. And then in, in Reconstruction, the insurgents didn't prevail militarily, but uh, and something we should keep in mind with Afghanistan, what they did have did do is they eroded the will of the North to the point where the North finally said, um, well, we're going to do what you know, we would now call reconciliation. We're going to bring these Southern whites back into the government. And so they did that, but they ended up losing everything that they had gone there to get in the first place, which was equality for blacks. In fact, the, the Jim Crow laws that came in after that were actually worse than what had been there before radical reconstruction began. Now, given the size of Afghanistan's security forces today and the plans that we have for expanding them, there is a definite leadership void that we need to try to find a way to fill somehow so that they're not out there terrorizing people or, or getting involved in drug activity and so forth. Um, now, the U.S. government seems to have ruled out the possibility that we will um, use American officers in command of those units, but there have been been many instances where Americans have become essentially the de facto leaders of those troops, whether they're advisors attached to them or 
they may be a so-called partnering arrangement, but because the Afghan commander is inexperienced or inept, the American essentially calls the shots. There are other cases where the Afghans do have some decent leaders, but nonetheless, you need to have Americans there to do certain things, technical things the Afghans maybe can't do. It also is very beneficial to have a lot of heavily armed Americans there because that makes the Afghans more comfortable to go out and get things done. And the Americans are there to, to keep an eye on the Afghans and, and see that they're going out and patrolling like they say they are and that they're not going up setting out setting up these roadside checkpoints where they uh, shake people down. And I think this need for American forces to, to bolster the Afghan forces are, is really the most compelling argument we have as to why there, there ought to be more Americans in Afghanistan. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the U.S. side of the equation. And the U.S. Army and the Marine Corps don't suffer from the gross leadership problems I've described in places like Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, but they still do have some significant problems, which I address in, in particular in the latter part of the book. I think the Army and Marine Corps have been too tolerant of poor leadership in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, in order to get some hard data for the book, I did a survey of American officers who had served in Iraq or Afghanistan, and, and this is published in the last part of the book. And there's some very interesting things that came out of this, and one of them was that 59% of the, the Army veterans and 49% of the Marines said that their service ought to relieve commanders for poor performance more often than is currently the case. And there's a number of reasons for this that were cited. One is that the procedures involved can be very onerous. There's also the sympathy factor I mentioned earlier. People feel they've invested in someone or, or they simply are a little too kind-hearted to, to fire someone. Um, there's also the fact that, you know, today if you get relieved, it's probably going to kill your career in the military, which wasn't always the case, and that's something we might want to think about reconsidering. Uh, the military, I think, all, and in particular the Army, have, have also not been promoting the right types of officers in the way I think they should. They're not promoting the people who are intuitive, outside-the-box thinkers, who are good at creating innovative solutions, who are good at complex problem-solving. And I think that uh, in this respect, they could learn some things from the business world. I, I worked in the business world for a, a few years, and I was struck by the fact that a lot of the more effective companies spend a lot of time trying to match personalities to tasks. Uh, they used personality tests like Myers-Briggs and many knockoffs of that, um, you know, to try to find the person who's got the sales personality and get them to sales, the person who's got the engineering mentality, get them into engineering, and, and uh, so on. Uh, the U.S. military does administer these tests, and, and we talk about them a lot at the, the school. In fact, that's how I got interested in this at, at first, because actually at first when I heard about these tests, I thought it was a bunch of uh, baloney. But um, actually, I think it, it is a very useful way uh, of managing personnel. The, uh, the military, I think, particularly needs this because the Military's tests show that the military is dominated by a certain group of personalities, which in the Myers-Briggs term are known as sensing judging. And these are people who rely mainly on the five senses to tell them about the world. They like details. They like uh, a lot of facts and structure. They like doing things with standing operating procedures. If you think of uh, you know, Danny Glover and Lethal Weapon or any of the other police chiefs who are insisting that things be done by the book, uh, that's the kind of person we're talking about. And they also tend to like 200-slide PowerPoint presentations, and they like to haggle over the font size and the color. Um, you will see, uh, and there's been more research done on this in the, the business world, so I do rely on a fair amount of that, and I think it's very interesting. The organizations that are dominated by these sensing, judging individuals uh, tend to rely on standardization, they like to use plans that are based on past experience. And this, this tends to work well if you're dealing with an activity that doesn't require a lot of change and you don't have an environment that's, that's fluid, like, for instance, construction, or if you're, if you're talking the military world, something like supply. Uh, it does not work so well when you've got organizations that are in a changing environment, have to deal with ambiguity, 
computer software in the, civ in the civilian world is a good example, and I think counterinsurgency is the prime example in the military world. The sensing judging organizations also tend to be more averse to taking risks. And another interesting finding from the counterinsurgency survey was that only 28% of the Army respondents said that their service actually encouraged commanders to take risk, which is a, a huge problem, counterinsurgency, because initiative and risk taking are, are fundamental. Um, now, if, if you look in the business world, there's really two types of organizations. One is the sensing judging, and the other one is called intuitive thinking, with a lot of people in the leadership who fall into the intuitive thinking category. And these in individuals, instead of relying on their, their physical senses, tend to use intuition to understand the world. They look at, focus on the abstract ideas and big, the big picture. And they find rigid structures and standard procedures to be unnecessarily confining. Think about someone like a Theodore Roosevelt or a uh, Steve Jobs or Erwin Ir Rommel. Um, they tend to like concise memos that get to the, the heart of the matter instead of these massive PowerPoint presentations, and they don't care much for the 14-step processes that other people like to use. Uh, and the organizations that have intuitive thinkers at the top tend to be very good at adapting to changing circumstances and to coming up with innovative solutions. Now, we've, we've seen there, there are actually quite a few of these people in the military, but they tend to be at the lower levels of the officer corps. So why are there not as many higher up? Well, uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that people at the higher ranks are more in the sensing judging category, and they tend to prefer people who, who think like they do. Um, and so I think we need to spend a lot of time, there is already a good amount of effort being spent on this, in trying to bring up and cultivate more of those intuitive thinking types. And this, in fact, lies at the heart of one of the most important struggles within the military today over the future of the officer corps. And you see, I think General Petraeus, General Casey, Secretary of Gates very much understand this, and you've probably seen them talking a lot about the importance of adaptive leadership. You know, General Petraeus came back, oversaw the, the Brigadier General Promotion Board because he felt that they were not giving a fair shake to the more intuitive thinking types. Um, you'd think that with those kind of heavyweights behind you that they would get things fixed, but there is still, I think, a large constituency in the military that is averse to making these changes. And you know, if you go, go into Iraq or Afghanistan, you notice there's a lot of people who are not out there in villages doing counterinsurgency. They're back doing things that can be standardized. So a lot of them have not bought into this idea yet. So I think we're going to see a, an ongoing battle here between the Army officers in the new mold and those in the old. And, and I'm hoping this book will, to some extent, be used as fire support in this battle. Thank you very much. Okay, can you all hear me in the cheap seats? Great. Um, my, my name is Tom Ricks. I'm going to provide a few comments, and I'm going to ask Mark to interrupt me as we go along. First, it is a real pleasure to be back at CSIS, where I did indeed write fiasco about five floors above here back in 2005. A lot of people back then used to say, you're going to call that book what? Are you sure? And I found out after about six months, nobody said that. And about a year later, a guy said to me, fiasco, well, duh. And I thought, you know, where were you when I needed you? Um, I want to begin by just saluting uh, several friends and I see in the audience from Johns Hopkins, from here, from Iraq and Afghanistan. I also want to ask a question. Would you put up your hand if you are a vet of Iraq or Afghanistan? Would you also put up your hand? Keep those hands up, please. Put up your hand if you are a vet of Vietnam or El Salvador. Okay. I just want to say thank you all very much for your service. And finally, put up your hand if you've been a troop advisor anywhere. A copy. Um, what about Oregon Province back there, Kyle? Okay, good. Just want to keep keep the interns honest here. Okay, uh, I agree with about 90% of what Mark said, but being a cranky sort, I'm going to focus on the 10% with which I don't agree. Which is why you should feel free to interrupt as we go along. Um, absolutely, leadership is necessary in counterinsurgency. 
uh, as it is in all forms of military operations. And I agree, leadership is even more necessary. Good, charismatic leadership is even more necessary in counterinsurgency. Uh, I saw this in Iraq. I think the great achievement of General Petraeus in Iraq was not counterinsurgency theory. Basically, that was hashed over stuff from the French and the British. What Petraeus' achievement was, was pushing it down through many echelons of command, through this sort of thing like battlefield circulation, through going out and talking. I ran into battalion and brigade commanders with whom Petraeus or Odierno or both had spent entire days sitting and talking, skipping the division, skipping the corps, down to battalion and brigade. I ran into platoon leaders who were quoting General Petraeus' uh, letters to the troops. I ran one day at LZ Jefferson into a private reading uh, David Galula, the French counterinsurgency theorist. This was a radical change. For the first time in the entire Iraq war, which we've been, been fighting for about five, four years, everybody was on the same sheet of music. There was a common purpose, a common understanding of common goals, a radical change in the way the military operated there. And it came, I think, primarily from the energy and willpower of Petraeus. So yes, it, leadership counts. Another contrary example of this is in Afghanistan, where General McKernan, I think, thought he was doing counterinsurgency. He was saying all the right words. He was issuing the right orders. They were talking about protecting the population. But Snuffy out in the field, or what they call Joes today, wasn't buying it. And nobody was saying, Joe, you don't get a vote here. You're going to do it, counterinsurgency. What you found in the field was enemy-centric operations, a real a uh, gap between what Bagram thought and what Hellman did. And that's an example of leadership not working. Leadership is necessary. Charism charismatic leadership is great, but I would say it is hardly sufficient. I have seen charismatic leadership without strategy. It is disastrous. You do not want to go there. Charismatic leadership without strategy or theory leads troops off a cliff. Uh, you have to have a strategy. Charismatic leadership without a strategy is a Ferrari without a steering wheel. And that's what we had driving around a lot of places in Iraq for the first four years of the war. A Ferrari without a steering wheel winds up in one place, in the ditch. Can I interject here? Absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, there are, I didn't get into this in the front. Oh, we good now? Okay. Uh, at the beginning of the book, I lay out what I think are 10 important attributes of counterinsurgency leaders, and one of them is charisma. Um, but I think there are a lot of others, and you don't have to have all those. And one of the other points I do make in the book is that you can be a very good conventional leader and be poor at counterinsurgency. And I think some of the individuals you're referring to would probably fit that mold. Uh, you know, they may be charismatic. You know, someone like George S. Patton, very charismatic, effective in, counter in conventional warfare, would he, be, would he have been good in counterinsurgency? I'm not so sure, and and I do think you, know, you do have to have some sort of, of basic strategy, but but without the you know having the battalion commanders there who can do it, um, you're not going to be able to turn that strategy into success. And and I know, um, and some of the stuff you've covered. I mean, they in, even when Petraeus was there, the battalion commanders were in many cases come up with their own way to try to bring over elites from the other side. They, a lot of it, you know, and Petraeus himself very much emphasized the decentralized uh, model. Mark, you ignorant slut. <laughs> that dates me. That takes you back to Saturday Night Live 30 years ago. Um, when local officials in Afghanistan were abusive or corrupt, that was a failure of both doctrine and leadership. Um, one of the problems that American officials have to face is your host government, if it is abusive, if it is corrupt, you need to act, act against that because that's your goal is to get people to support that host government, not necessarily to get them to support you. You really don't care at the end of the day whether they support you as long as they will give some form of grudging allegiance or at least tolerance to the host government. Uh, I was really struck. I was reading an interview with some Afghan villagers who were explaining why they preferred the Taliban to the Afghan police. They said, look, we don't like the Taliban coming in saying we all have to grow beards and the women can't come into the marketplace. But 
at least they're not like the police who came in and took our little boys and raped them. That is a problem. That's something you need to deal with. That's one reason, actually, I think that General McChrystal's plan uh, is an intelligent one that says you need to get troops out there with the Afghan police in order to police their behavior. We have two enemies in Afghanistan. One is the Taliban and its allies. The other is the Afghan government. And the only way to deal with both of them is to put in additional troops and have them co-located with Afghan forces. We need to remember as we discuss all this also the counterinsurgency, while we're talking th about the finer points of how many counterinsurgents can dance on the head of a pin, I think counterinsurgency is still a minority view inside the U.S. military. Petraeus may be a hero of the American people. I think he's an outlier to the general officer corps of the U.S. Army. They don't like Petraeus. Now, they're too polite to say so publicly. But Petraeus has three strikes against him. He likes reporters and, reporters and politicians and, and Washington. He had a successful first tour in Iraq. And he is a PhD from Princeton. In the U.S. Army, that's three strikes. Now, they, they've tolerated it, but they've kind of pushed him out in the joint world. Stay out there. Don't, don't come back to the Army and pollute our, our young troops. Uh, so I think there's a real problem here in just getting people to take on uh, counterinsurgency theory. This is one of the jobs of leadership is to go out and actually make sure the battalion commanders are with the program, that they're not just giving you lip service and then going and hitting the local shake over the head because, they, because it, it vents some frustration. Uh, on leadership, I totally endorse Mark's view of relief of ineffective or weak leaders. This is a lost tool in the U.S. military. It's a great management tool. I believe it should be used more often. In my short, unhappy life as a newsroom manager, uh, I only fired one person. And I'll tell you both, he and I were happier the next day. He's now a successful screenwriter in Hollywood. Uh, he was not a good reporter. He's probably the smartest person I ever had worked for me. But he'd go up to Capitol Hill co to cover hearings and read Charles Dickens novels and, and miss large chunks of essential testimony to the Wall Street Journal on what happened at the banking committee yesterday. You don't do anybody any favors by leaving them in a position for which they are not fit. Uh, this isn't just people who don't get it. It's simply people who are at odds with you. But the corollary to that is relief cannot be a career terminator. It simply has to be you're not the right person for this job right now. You are a useful, good, honest, loyal, dutiful officer, and we will find another position for you. That's essentially what made uh, general officer management work in World War II. In World War II, you were either successful, dead, or relieved within 90 days, sometimes less than that. But relief did not end your career. Hanging San Williams, one of the great nicknames ever, in the U.S. military, was a assistant division commander in France, 1944, was relieved as ADC and demoted to colonel. Stayed in the Army and retired 15 years later as a three-star general. Uh, even more famous case, General Terry de la Mesa Allen, commanded the 1st Infantry Division in Sicily, 1943, the first time that American troops fought German troops on European soil. He won that first crucial battle and for his pains was relieved. A year later, he was commanding another, another division, 104th, uh, across northern France and into Germany and, and had a happy and, and, and um, very successful leadership of, of that division. Relief also, and this is, I think, even more important to back up Mark on this, encourages risk-taking. All war requires risk-taking. Um, but I think in a one-year rotation system, and we've seen variants of this now in Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq, and a one-year rotation system creates a powerful disincentive for risk-taking. What you get is a lot of commanders who think, keep my head down, go home, um, and we'll be okay. Why take any risk? The incentive is towards inaction. The threat of relief, I think, balances that incentive system and creates more of an incentive to get out there and to take the kind of initiative and risk-taking that, as Mark said, are essential, especially in counterinsurgency. Next, what works? Uh, yes, absolutely, the mega-projects um, 
are not the way to go. What I think of as the Stalinist five-year projects, we're going to build a cement plant, we're going to restore electricity. Uh, while Americans fiddled about restoring electricity, I saw half of Baghdad string up little generators. And when Donald Rumsfeld flew over Baghdad and said, see, the lights are on, it was not because of anything he did. It was because of all those little Sony generators that were across Baghdad, strung together in neighborhoods. Look at what the locals do. The locals frequently know what the solutions are. They just need some help. Micro projects are definitely the way to go. Quick projects that are sustainable and can be seen and controlled by locals. Uh, I can't remember whether it was Chris Holshek who pointed out this out to me or somebody else in Iraq who said, don't hand out soccer balls. Give them to the sheikh to hand out. Empower the local. Don't make them like you. You're going to be gone. The sheikh needs help. Give him the soccer ball. Kill or capture. Yeah, you got to kill or capture a few, but I think fewer than we think. Uh, you will not find stronger advocates of a counterinsurgency uh, approach than people who have tried to kill or capture their way out of Iraq um, and Afghanistan. And this is one reason I think that General McChrystal is such a powerful advocate of counterinsurgency. He's tried Plan A, and he knows it didn't work. Okay, well, yeah, I would, I would, uh, I, I do agree with that. And I, my point, as I mentioned, there is the, the enemy centric view, which really focuses on the enemy. And I think they're partially correct in that there are some who would go overboard and say, we don't really need to focus on the enemy at all. In fact, there's some language in the counterinsurgency manual that says that. But uh, you, you do have to do some of that. I think, you know, General Petraeus would certainly tell you, I mean, a lot of his guidance does say you know, we have to be relentless in pursuing the enemy. But that's, can't be all you do because then you do get in the problems you talked about. So you do also have to work on local governance and bringing the population in. Don't forget also the most relentless way in which General Petraeus pursued the enemy was running after them with wads of dollar bills, um, not with a weapon in his hand. Uh, the key fact in ending the Sunni insurgency in Iraq, or at least achieving a ceasefire to be more precise, was General Petraeus agreed to pay $30 million a month to put 100,000 Sunni insurgents on the payroll. They were not disarmed. They were not demobilized. They remain with their weapons in their units controlling areas. So it was a very generous ceasefire. Not a bad deal. 30 million bucks. That's what George Steinbrenner pays for a mediocre second baseman. Um, 30 million bucks bought at least a long-term ceasefire. Now, how long it lasts, we don't know. There's a lot of smart people who think Iraq is still going to have a pretty good civil war down the road. Uh, finally, um, something Mark's book also speaks to that I think is quite crucial is the problem of counterinsurgency in foreign countries. And yes, this is a big, big hole in the current American counterinsurgency doctrine uh, that, the, that the manual, 3-24, does not speak to at all. This is a problem in American counterinsurgency theory. We borrowed lock, stock, and barrel, French and British theory. French and British theory comes from their colonial experiences. Why is that important? Because they were fighting to stay in those colonies. Americans are fighting to leave the places we're in. So we have a very different outcome in mind. So the host government is not something we own to which we can appoint. Sir Gerald or the London police chief. It's something we're trying to set up so we can get out of there. Uh, it's a whole different set of problems, especially, and this is something I'm just trying to think my way through now, when the host government's interests diverge from us. Exhibit A, Jem in South Vietnam. Exhibit B, Maliki in Iraq. Exhibit C, Karzai in Afghanistan. I think there comes a point in every counterinsurgency in which you have at all, at all are successful, that the host government must divorce you, must try to stand on its own two feet, must effectively become anti-American in some form. Uh, that takes care of my comments, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to comment. I think this is a really thoughtful, insightful book that all of you need to go by back there at the end of this thing. Okay, I'd like to open it up. We have time for just a couple questions um, for, for Mark and for Tom. And as, as uh, Tom pointed out, um, please do visit the back table. We have uh, copies of this fantastic book. Um, and as many of you can tell, Tom is a legendary Red Sox fan. 
Right here. Thank you. Uh, Masood Aziz from Afghanistan. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. I think that obviously you're pointing out to leadership as being an important aspect of, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, of uh, command, and, command and control structure that the Army is. Uh, to me, that would be an obvious factor that's an important thing, but you're also saying it's important in counterinsurgency. I I'm not sure uh, if by doing that, uh, you're leaving aside a number of other extremely important aspects of counterinsurgency that needs to be developed. That is, counterinsurgency in terms of its relationship to governance, in terms of its relationship to uh, actually development, but also developing aspects of uh, understanding, being adaptive to the local environment, understanding culture, history, habits, and in case of Afghanistan, the extreme complex dynamics of tribes. So I think that uh, by only making that focus, perhaps that some of these things are uh, left on the table. You also mentioned aid as not being that helpful, and so therefore we have to focus on, on leadership. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, if that's why we should do that. Aid wasn't effective, like I think Tom mentioned, in Afghanistan because of, of the delivery process of aid from the international community in Afghanistan. 90, uh, you know, 90 cents on a dollar made it to, to the ground. That's why it wasn't effective. So small projects, I think, was important. And uh, my question relates to something else that you, you brought up, and that is that um, certain leadership is important in the, in the command and control process of the U.S. Uh, uh, military involvement, for example, in Afghanistan. But you also mentioned that uh, leadership is also important and that it's something that ought to be done by the counterinsurgent um, factors, the, the U.S. NATO command, in terms of affecting local host government structures of leadership. I think that, uh, you know, Tom mentioned some issues about police and training of the Afghan army. I would certainly agree with that. But you want to be careful how far you want to take that. You certainly don't want to be perceived as affecting directly government in terms of its leadership because that's something that would, could be used against you uh, very, very easily. That's the case in Pakistan. That's against the U.S. That's the issue raised. In Afghanistan, it's not that issue yet. So you have to, that's my question, is if you want to elaborate that. All right. Well, yeah, you, made, you raised a couple important issues. Let me just hit, hit on those quickly. And, and I mean, maybe did not cover these in enough detail, but in terms of governance um, as well as security and all these other things, leadership's important in all of those. Corruption is almost entirely a problem of bad leadership, especially in Afghanistan, because the Afghans will tell you that if somebody is taking a bribe, their boss is probably involved in it too. And, and so if you don't have a police chief who uh, has some integrity, there's going to be corruption. If the mayor uh, doesn't have their proper characteristics, there's going to be corruption. In terms of you mentioned also dealing with the tribes, good leaders are going to have that intuition and that complex problem solving skill that will help them. Um, deal with it. Now, in terms of the question about influencing, the United States influencing who Afghanistan's leaders are, um, there's actually a lot of this going on already. Uh, and if you talk to Americans who've worked over there with the police, for example, which has horrific leadership problems, there have been some just terrible Afghan police chiefs who were corrupt or didn't know what they were doing, and we've gone to the Afghans and said, um, this guy really needs to go. And uh, now, we haven't always twisted their arm. And, and for, fortunately, one of the really good things that's happened lately in Afghanistan is they've got a new interior minister came in last year, Atmar, who's been very cooperative with us. And so in most, in most cases, actually, when, he, when he's involved, we'll go to him and say, so-and-so is corrupt, um, so-and-so is allowing his troops to rape young boys. Uh, he, will, he will get them out of there. Uh, now, there's still exceptions. If somebody's a relative of Karzai, then things get become problematic. And there is... Again, you know, we like to think that we're going to defer to the host nation's judgment, um, but, you know, sometimes we've got to ha have a role, and the same thing goes, too, with in Iraq early on. We said, well, we're going to let the Afghans do it. You know, everyone cites T. Lawrence that you've got to let the native population do it themselves. Well, sometimes that just doesn't work, and sometimes the Americans have to get more involved. Question over here. Hi, Tom. 
Okay, I've, I've got two comments. Colonel Chris Holshek, I'm a civil affairs guy. Um, and I've got kind of a comment on, for Tom and then a question for Mark. Um, I've got to pick up on where you left off on your final point because I think in, in my experience as a pr practitioner uh, in, in this uh, kind of business to include low-level counterinsurgency operations I just did in Liberia, um, I just want to point out that Chris Olshek was one of the great heroes of civil affairs in Iraq in 0304 when he tried to keep Bakuba from blowing up. Uh, thanks. Um, I think there's way too much emphasis on hearts and minds. As I like to tell people, I, re I don't care if you like me because I'm going home to ride my Harley Davidson. Okay? So my mission here is to make you like yourself. And and because because we're gone at some time, you know, it's that uh, T. E. Lawrence thing. You know, our our time is short, and it's not our country. So the the emphasis should be uh, I like to call on not just capacity but on confidence, on their part, and that's that's been my approach to it. Um, so I certainly can underscore we in our doctrine and our approaches, it's way too much about hearts and minds, and and I think we just lose a lot of resources that way. That's just a comment, uh, Mark. I found your, your presentation fascinating, but I've also read uh, John Nagel's book and have talked with John at length. Um, he, he learned to eat uh, soup with a knife. And he t his, of course, his premise is that successful counterinsurgency it is predicated on which is the better learning organization. And I wondered if you could comment on, on your very patient uh, insight about the role of leadership and then this idea of learning organizations and how those two connect. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think there are aspects of the, the learning organization model that are very important. And you know, one of the points I make in the book is it was a big mistake to throw counterinsurgency out the window, as the Army basically did after Vietnam. Now, the Marine Corps did continue to do some instruction. It's always been part of their mission. So I think you want that to be uh, an important part. But there is, I think you do, there is a danger. And, and I, there's an interview with General Mattis I did, which is quoted in the book to talk about this. Uh, if you focus too much on being a learning organization, you tend to get too drawn into your doctrine and you try too much to rely on the past. And that, again, gets back to this issue of certain personalities like to use the past more than to think innovatively about the present. And, you know, Mattis's point was he thinks we, uh, the, the U.S. military has to some extent become over-reliant on its doctrine. I think certainly the Army has a greater tendency in that regard. But as I, you know, as I said, too, um, every situation is different. I do think, again, you can't use a model and apply it everywhere, but I have found that most of the good practitioners, certainly the, the very good ones, are, have studied a lot of history, so they have a lot of familiarity with the subject, which, you know, Clausewitz talks about this in, in his book about how um, – you want to have a lot of familiar, you're not going to know the answers, but if you spend a lot of time studying it and thinking about it and look, capturing lessons learned, when you get to that situation, you'll have a toolbox that will help you address those problems. That's what I add. I've always thought you could summarize this discussion in one line. The Army has a doctrine. The Marine Corps has a culture. We've got time for one more. Let's go right in the back. Mark Viola, uh, I was wondering, could you comment on intelligence, the value of intelligence, the expanding role of intelligence? And I'm not talking about targeting. I'm talking about strategic use of intelligence, especially as it related to the population and the, the culture and so forth. Well, most of what I cover in the book is on, in terms of intelligence, is the human intelligence. And I think really the uh, most important intelligence in counterinsurgency is that, is that, that human level at that local level and getting the villagers to tell you where the insurgents are, who they are, which again comes back to leadership. My first book on the Phoenix program in Vietnam had a great deal about that. And you know, one of the, that's part of how I got into this was I was looking, talking to all these intelligence officers who worked in Vietnam and they said, you know, so well, why, how, which areas were you getting more intelligence? Where did you have the cooperation supporting you or helping you more. And it was always came back to a question of who was the South Vietnamese district chief or police chief or what have you. So I think it's um, critical there. I mean, in terms of um, the largest strategic intelligence, uh, are you talking about in terms of sort of understanding culture or in a country or – 
I think I think we're doing what needs to be done. And I think, um, as I mentioned, battlefield circulation of commanders is a, a big part of this because if you have someone like a General McChrystal who's going out and talking to the people at uh, in the field, you, he tends to learn more that way than um, if he sits back in the in his headquarters, like General Sanchez did, for example, in Iraq. Um, I mean, we certainly there's a lot of other intel stuff out there that we don't know about. But I think, uh, you know, if you're looking at the intelligence that's going to be used to make a decision on whether to commit more troops, um, I think we've probably got a, a pretty good handle of it at, at the higher levels because of the fact that we've got commanders there who are, you know, spent the time to go out and hear from the horse's mouth what's going on in these districts. Um, so that's. Any comments on that? Okay. I, I want to give uh, great thanks to Mark Moyer and Tom Ricks for this terrific discussion. Um, again, we do have uh, books in the back, and, and thanks again for uh, your remarks, and thanks to, to all of you for coming today. Appreciate it.